Extensive rebuilds of warships were a fairly common thing in the interwar period and the Cold War. You had such things as the Italian battleship rebuilds as an easy example, or the continued modernization of old aircraft carriers during the Cold War. There were even such things as the Guppy program in an attempt to bring old submarines up to date. In the modern day, however, such drastic rebuilds have largely gone away. The odd one still happens here and there, but the attention-grabbing ones are few and far between. One notable exception to that rule, however, comes from the Indian Navy, where, in the early 2000s, they took an old Soviet ship and completely rebuilt it into a proper aircraft carrier. Considering the aforementioned Soviet ship being a heavy aviation cruiser, this was all the more impressive. Let's take a look at that process now, starting with a brief overview of the ship's Soviet and Russian service. And it will be brief, as her service here lasted less than a decade, and coincided with the fall of the Soviet Union and the general chaos and decay of 1990s Russia. Laid down under the name Baku on February 17, 1978, this ship began her life as the fourth of the Kiev-class ships, which are typically called aircraft carriers in Western documentation, although the Soviets insisted on calling them aviation cruisers. Regardless of where you fall on that particular divide, it will become relevant later on. In any event, Baku was a slightly improved model compared to her earlier sister ships. She had improved radar, electronic systems, and a larger command and control system. This generally sees her labeled as a subclass, or a half-sister, compared to the earlier vessels. These modifications would end up proving to be somewhat finicky in actual service, as it would turn out. Baku launched on April 1st, 1982. She went a commission into the Red Navy until December of 1987. The commonly given reason is glitches and technical issues with her new systems, which with this being the late Soviet Union, I can believe that being a thing. Regardless, her service with the Russian Navy, in either Soviet or Federation form, would prove to be short-lived. After all, she would only spend about four years under the Red Banner. Since the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, which led almost immediately to a similar collapse in the new Russian Navy, unable to afford the vast fleet built by the Soviets. Baku, in particular, would suffer here. Renamed to Admiral Gorshkov, the ship did not have a happy life. From what I've been able to dig up, she spent a couple years on training duty or laid up dockside. By 1994, she had suffered a boiler explosion. Repairs to that damage would take until 1995, though the Russians would quickly pull Gorshkov from service in 1996. This isn't particularly surprising. Ignoring Russia's economic woes for the moment, the shipyard that built the vessel was in the newly independent Ukraine. Spare parts were, as could be expected, something of an issue. As a result of this, the still new ship languished in mothballs from 1996 until, in 2004, the Indian Navy came knocking. You could write a book on the following saga, and still probably have material left over. That said, I am not particularly interested in getting into the political weeds on this, not least because it's still something of a fresh wound for all parties involved. And the exact truth of the mess is still a bit buried beneath partisan arguments and shady dealings. So I will give a brief overview, and then focus on the result of the agreement. In 2004, after some time negotiating a deal, India and Russia agreed to not only transfer Gorshkov to the Indian Navy, but to comprehensively rebuild her. The initial deal saw the Indian Navy gain the laid-up and deteriorated vessel for free, but with the understanding that they would foot the bill on the refit and on aircraft to operate from her. The original agreement was for $800 million to put towards the rebuild, and a further billion dollars for the aircraft and weapons. $1.8 billion all told. Although I've also seen different numbers, like $970 million for the rebuild, and $1.5 billion overall thrown around. This would have been something of a steal for what was hoped to be a fully capable, if small, aircraft carrier by the end of it. The intention was for the ship to be in Indian service by 2008, which was perhaps a bit overly optimistic. As is often the case, even with no political dealings or national posturing involved, the price began to rapidly balloon out. By 2007 and into 2008, 
the rebuild was only about halfway complete. Not to mention, the Russian shipyard was starting to demand far more money for the project. To the tune of around $2 billion more dollars, with an added statement by an executive that the market price of an equivalent new built carrier would be 3 to $4 billion. The obvious implication being that even with an extra $2 billion, the Indians were still getting a good deal on their new ship. It didn't help here that Russia made some noises about keeping the ship for themselves if India didn't pay up. In the end, by 2010, the Indian government had reluctantly agreed to a final price of $2.2 billion. This was much less than the Russian shipyard wanted. It was also far more than India had gone into this expecting to spend on the ship alone. I won't comment further on the political side of things at this point, so let's look at the ship India ended up with. By now renamed to INS Vikramaditya, which I probably butchered, the completely rebuilt aircraft carrier was commissioned into the Indian Navy in late 2013, although she only formally entered active service in mid-2014. In comparison to her origin as Baku, the carrier is almost unrecognizable. In that original design, she was only capable of operating helicopters and VTOL, vertical takeoff and landing, aircraft. That meant Yak-38s in her Soviet career. Baku's main hitting power came not from her aircraft, but from the cruise missiles she carried on her bow. It was those missiles that kept the ship from having a proper, full-length flight deck capable of operating more traditional aircraft. As the Indian Navy wanted a proper aircraft carrier, those missiles had to go. The weapons were stripped out, and in their place, a ski jump was added. Specifically, a ski jump of 14.3 degrees, allowing for more traditional launching of aircraft. Similarly, a resting gear was fitted to allow her to land aircraft the old-fashioned way. This consists of three arrestor wires and three gears to go along with them. Further structural modifications were made, including sponsons to increase the width of the flight deck. After all, just replacing the cruise missiles with a ski jump wasn't going to be enough. The former missile deck wasn't designed to be connected to the former flight deck in a manner that allowed for aircraft launching. Thus, you can see the sponsons when you look at a top-down view of Baku and Vikramaditya. It's most notable on the stern, where an extra section of hull was added specifically to enable proper launches off the ski jump. Less immediately visible, but still present, was an increase to her stern length, to, once again, increase the runway area available. All of these changes amounted to 234 new hull sections being fabricated and fitted to the hull, or something like 2,500 tons of extra weight, which would bring her displacement up to roughly 45,000 tons at full loading. That is not an insubstantial amount of work, even without talking about improvements to her old elevators or needing to rebuild most, if not all, of the 2,500 or so compartments aboard, as well as rebuilding the superstructure to fit a new and more modern radar. Just fixing up the deterioration from her time in mothballs was a massive task in its own right. This isn't even touching on the fact the ship had to have her electrical system stripped out and completely replaced to power her more modern radar and other systems. Similarly, her boilers were replaced by new models running off of diesel fuel. Boilers that may or may not still have issues, considering I've seen reference to 7 out of 8 suffering breakdowns on her first post-refit sea trials. In any event, Vikramaditya's power plant is, as designed, capable of 180,000 shaft horsepower. This allows for a speed in excess of 30 knots, though I'm unaware of any source giving an exact number on her speed. Now, to round off the changes to her design, the Indians initially got the ship with no weaponry fitted. This left her rather reliant on escorts or her own air wing for self-defense, which is not exactly an ideal situation. It wouldn't be until 2015 that after a short refit, Vikramaditya was fitted with self-defense weapons. In this case, four AK-630 Seawiz guns and a Barak-1 surface-to-air missile system stripped from an old frigate. This would, in turn, be replaced by a more modern Barak 8 system in 2017. With all of this work done, what did the Indian Navy actually get their hands on? Well, they got what amounts to a mid-sized, mostly modern, aircraft carrier. 
nearly unrecognizable compared to her original Soviet origin, Vikram Aditya is, when everything is actually working, a capable ship. Probably not as good as a new-built ship, but still a decent carrier when all is said and done. She is capable of operating some 36 aircraft. This is generally going to be a maximum of 26 MiG-29K fighters for her fixed-wing aircraft, alongside 10 helicopters, either Sea Kings or Kamov Ka-31s. That said, with all of her design history done, is there much in the way of service history to talk about? Well, not really. Vikram Aditya only properly entered Indian naval service in 2014, as I mentioned earlier. That service did begin with an admittedly impressive journey, lasting 26 days and covering 10,212 nautical miles from Russia to India. But after that journey, she has largely stuck close to home, operating on patrol and training duties, about what you'd expect of peacetime work. With the Indian Navy not being called upon to support military operations, there hasn't been much need for their new aircraft carrier to actually do much. I could go over details here, like her refit schedules, or the fact that the carrier made the first visit of an Indian warship to Colombo and Sri Lanka in 30 years. But there aren't really many interesting notes to make here in the grand scheme of things. One can say that isn't a bad thing, as India has managed to avoid getting roped into conflicts that would require Vikram Aditya to sortie in combat conditions. It does mean, though, that the most interesting bits of her service history are related to other ships, such as images of the former Soviet ship operating alongside American and Japanese ships, presenting an interesting visual image. And an interesting historic footnote at that, since I doubt anyone who built Baku expected she would be sailing alongside Nimitz in the 21st century. A similar thing happens when you see Vikram Aditya sailing alongside the domestically built and designed carrier INS Vikrant. These images demonstrate that India is, at least theoretically, a two-carrier navy. Although, from what I've read, the Indians do have something of an issue supplying enough planes and pilots for both ships to operate at full capacity. In any case, the story of Baku, of Vikram Aditya, is a convoluted one. Even so, one can hardly deny the technological triumph in how she turned out, no matter what flaws may or may not be present in the final product. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and I'll see you in the next one.